Hi there, I'm Naj Khan. Today we are honored to be joined by a community leader, a lifelong educator, and the former principal at Columbine High School, Frank DeAngelis. Frank, thank you so Thanks much for, for having for me and the opportunity. Us. Tell us a little bit about your work that you currently do right now. You travel all over, you still educate, but tell us about the work you do. Right, uh, since I've been retired, now prior to when I retired, uh, I did some work with communities that went through similar situations with Columbine, Sandy Hook and Virginia Tech. But since I've retired, I've reached out and I'm uh, really doing some presentations. I'm doing some trainings and it's a uh, very diverse uh, groups that I present to. I've done uh, school resource officers, uh, judges, justices, uh, schools, of course. And so I'm just trying to reach out to tell my story. And then I do some work for some organizations. Uh, one that stands out is the I Love You Guys Foundation. Uh, it was started by John Michael Keyes and Ellen Keyes, who lost their daughter Emily tragically back on uh, the 26th of, or the 27th of September back in 2006. And so I'm part of their organization. And then I do some work with Michelle Gay, who's Safe and Sound School, whose daughter Joey was uh, killed at Sandy Hook. So I'm doing a lot of work, uh, you know, community service work, volunteer work, but uh, going out and trying to spread the word, try to, you know, help people the best I can. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert, but I just tell my story that a lot of people can relate. The stories you go out and you tell now, your experiences, uh, how you've grown, changes that have been made. If you look back to all of your years as an educator, what you're telling people now, the stories you're telling, how would that have benefited not just you, but your colleagues and counterparts 20 years ago, 25 years ago? You know, the stories I tell now would have helped us greatly. I mean, there was no manual on how to deal with this, and it was just a day by day, a lot of trial and error. And so there were lessons learned. And so now when other schools call, I state this is what we did. We didn't know anything about it. I, the thing that stands out in my mind, now we're talking 1999, and prior to that, the only drills we did were fire drills. And I'm sure in California they did earthquake drills and places where tornadoes occur, they do tornado drills. We did fire drills. And, you know, when I make the reference, how many students have lost their life to fire or staff members? But now we're doing these drills that, you know, they we don't know, knew nothing about it. And I, it's just a way of life. And it's not only in schools. I think we see it happening in churches. We see it happening in businesses. And it's just being prepared. And it's not to scare people. It's not to create anxiety. But I think the thing that I try to, and I hate to say the word preach, but the thing that I try to share with people is people in their minds, they feel that these events happen in other communities that can never happen in ours. And there are others that feel if we don't, if we talk about, if we don't talk about it, it's not going to happen. And, and I state, you know, it can happen on any given day, the unthinkable. And that's what, it's not to put the fear in them. It's just to prepare them and to realize that you need to be prepared. I got, um, I, I have some statistics here that I just wanted to, to throw your way as we continue this conversation. In the 1990s, prior to Columbine, uh, there were more than 50 public school shootings. 55 students died, more than 100 were injured. And yet, in the similar fashion of 9-11, where everybody remembers where they were, everybody has some type of connection to it, when you bring up the word Columbine, that's really where people really think about school violence and school shootings happening. It's not the originator, but some people really feel like it is. Why do you think that is? And that's such a great question because people will tell me it was the first school shooting. I said, well, if you look at it historically, there were school shootings going back to the 1700s. And even within the 1900s, when you look at Pearl, Mississippi, Jonesboro, Springfield, uh, Illinois, Paducah, uh, Kentucky, but uh, you hear Columbine. And even in the aftermath, there's been, I don't know how many shootings since Columbine, but Columbine seems to resonate even 20 years later. And my theory on it, and I share this during my presentation, as it was the time of the 24-7 news cycle, that these stories were brought into our living room. When I appear at these conferences, someone inevitably comes up and says, I remember where I was. I was a freshman sitting in my dorm room watching what was transpiring, you know, on the camera. In, in, in Colorado, 
we probably went an entire year where there was a story or an article about Columbine High School. So we kept bringing it into the living room. And I think that's the reason we continue to talk about it. And I believe that the media has learned lessons about Columbine. And, you know, one of the things that I worry about is a lot of the media, they have to report. But there were times that I felt that they were glorifying the two killers. And I know the two killers in their journals and in their videotapes that they made a year prior, they said, we're gonna, our legacy is going to live on forever, that they will never forget us. And unfortunately, that is happening, that if we look to Sandy Hook, uh, the killer made mention of Columbine. If you look to Virginia Tech, the killer made mention of Columbine. And so we saw it happening. One of the things that resonates in my mind, it was right before Christmas of 1999, Time Magazine ran an article and they had the picture on the cover of Time Magazine, their December issue of the two killers walking through the halls. And I'm thinking in my mind, we should be memorializing the 13 who lost their lives. And there were kids that picked up those magazines and saying, boy, I can become famous too. Look at all the attention. And that's what scares me a little bit on how the media betrays it. But now I think the media have learned lessons. Uh, I think it was Anderson Cooper who said he started the no no notoriety after Sandy Hook. He said, so many times we know who the killer is, but we don't know the kids who lost their lives, and which I think is an outstanding statement. And uh, I'm just listening to as you answered that question, and then you talked a little bit about what Anderson Cooper says about no notoriety. I've listened to you talk about these various incidents have, that have taken place, and you don't name anybody. And no. do you follow in that thinking of it's more important to recognize the victims and survivors? Right. I do believe in the no notoriety, and from day one, uh, I don't speak their names. And, you know, and there have been people who have approached me uh, at the beginning of my presentation. I have pictures of the 12 students and Mr. Sanders, and I had people approach and say, well, Mr. DeAngelis, Mr. D, you know, there were 15 who died, and there should be pick. And I said, well, here's what I have to say. You know, the 13 who lost their lives, they didn't have a choice. The other two did. And I realized that, you know, the two lost their lives, and I offered condolences to their parents because they, too, they lost a child also. But those two had that choice that day, and, and that's, you know, my thinking behind it. And, and I really challenge people when I go out to some of these perform or some of these presentations, and I said, by the time... I finish presenting because I start with their names, I end with their names, because when I walk in, there's times I say, associate names with Columbine tragedy. They may be able to name one or two students, but they could give me the names of the two killers. And I said, what I want is I want these kids who lost their life, and Mr. Sanders, I want their names to be known. And that's what I do, the reason I do what I do. But you talk about the 13 that lost their life at Columbine. But the PTSD that comes from something like this affects so many more. Tell me about the experience that you witnessed with the PTSD days, weeks, months, years later by those who were somehow connected to this incident. Right. Well, it's amazing. And I think one of the lessons that we learned is people felt that within three years, everyone was going to be back to normal. The issues were not going to happen. And there seemed to be situations where people seemed to be doing okay. And then all of a sudden, there's a traumatic event that happens in their life that traumatizes them or triggers emotion. And they're coming back saying, we need help, and the help is not there. And when I talked to these various groups last year, being uh, Parkland and uh, Santa Fe and other places, I state the groups that you need to worry about is, for example, our class was the class of 1999. They were in school for a month and two days, and then they graduated. Now, it was tough for the class of 2000 to 2002. They had to come back, and they had to relive it, but we had each other. The class of 99, they're off and about, and some go on to college, some join the workforce. All of a sudden, a teacher starts talk, a professor starts talking about Columbine, they have a meltdown, or they're in a place where a fire alarm goes off and they have an, an episode and they didn't have that support. In, in talking to parents of these kids from 1999, they said, Frank, we would have listened in not only 99, but the other class, we wish we would have listened to you because most of the time the kids are saying, I'm fine, I don't need anything. And then all of a sudden down the road, they're uh, struggling. And I have 
you know, parents calling me, they're concerned about their kids. Well, they're 38 year old adults, 37 year old adults that they're suffering from, you know, alcohol consumption and abuse and drug abuse and things of that nature. And, and, and I'm trying to reach out and get them help now. But in the other class, and people say, well, we never thought about that, is the incoming class. For us, it was a class of 2003. I just had a conversation with Patricia Greer from Marshall County, and her class would be this year's freshman class. And she said, Frank, we never anticipated that they felt like loners when you came in. And for us, it was a class of 2003 because those poor kids could not do anything right. If they were crying, the people are saying, why are you crying? You weren't here. If they were laughing and joking, saying, do you realize you're on hollow ground? What are you doing? Show respect. And it was tough for them that first year. And I, and I tell people when I talk to these other communities, you need to reach out to those people also. And same thing with staff members. We hired staff members after that weren't there that day. And a lot of times the staff, they didn't know how to act. You know, you weren't here. How do you know what we're feeling? So these are all things that we learned as we went along the way that I try to share now. You talked about that day being this beautiful Colorado spring day. And I know you've probably relived and reviewed, um, but your experience about when you found out about what was going on was was unique. Can you just describe that for us? Sure. Um, there were so many different things that happened that day that were out of the ordinary. At Columbine, we had two lunches. We were, we were a school at that time of about close to 2000, 1975, four grade levels, and usually, we, we met with the kids uh, 175 days. Well, probably out of 170, I'm down in the cafeteria because I love that time of day being with the kids. But on that day, I didn't start out at Columbine. I was actually off campus at a meeting for some students that were being recognized by the Chamber of Commerce. So I'm late arriving to school, and I'm sitting in my office when my secretary runs in and reports there's gunfire in I'm, I'm in disbelief. The first thing that crossed my mind is this has to be a, you know, a senior prank. The seniors are about a month away from graduation. And, you know, I can count on two hands in the 20 years I was there, fist fights. I mean, this was, a, it, this was an ideal community. It was a school where, I mean, if we had job openings, we would have hundreds of people that wanted to, you know, work at Columbine. And so when I heard those words, I was in disbelief until I came out of my office and I saw a gunman coming towards me, so my worst nightmare became a reality. And uh, I go back to that day, and I still i am in shock to just envision what happened. And even when we talk about it now, I get some of those same feelings that I went through back then, you know, that whole fight, flight, and freeze, things slowing down. And, and I learned a very important lesson uh, from a counselor that I was seeing and continue to see when I first went back to Columbine, because we couldn't finish the school year, we ended up going over to Chatfield. But as principals, we only get a couple of weeks during the summer. You know, the teachers and students get about eight weeks. Well, I had to go back to Columbine right after 4th of July. And when I walked back in that building, I was reliving everything that I had experienced. And I'd walk out of the hallway, and I would start crying. I'd get nauseous. Next day, I'd walk a little bit further, and I finally talked to my counselor. He said, Frank, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. If you're going to continue to be the principal, we need to change your mindset that when you walk down the hallway, if you see that gunman coming towards you, if you see walking over dead bodies, you're never going to be able to continue to be the principal at that school. He said, you need to somehow train your mind to envision these kids living their lives. And so when I started walking down the hallway, I envisioned Lauren Townsend, who was a volleyball player, I'd walk by the gym, and instead of me envisioning hiding with the girls in the gym, I envisioned Lauren Townsend playing volleyball, or I envisioned Rachel Scott, who was a great actress on the stage, and so I changed that mindset that allowed me to continue to be the principal, and these were just, I'm, I'm a big proponent of counseling, and that's one of the things that I offer to people when I go to these communities that have um, experienced similar uh, situations. Now, we are talking uh, within hours of the one-year anniversary at Parkland. We're weeks away from the 20th anniversary at Columbine. And you've said before when people ask, you know, how do we get back to normal? And you've said you can't get back to normal. You have to redefine normal. Right. Can you explain that? Sure. And I, 
I really believe that people believe, they have this belief that they're going to wake up some morning and it's going to be back to the way it was. It never is. And it's not that you can't move forward and heal, but if they think it's going to be similar in Parkland or, you know, it's not. I mean, your life's changed forever and you've got to remember that. And I, and I think what is, causes some anxiety is when people feel, well, you know, after the one-year anniversary, it's going to be great. And, and you do. Each day gets a little bit better. But I use the uh, statement, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And, you know, at Parkland, the principal, Tyler Thompson, would call and say, gosh, things are going great. Three weeks later, he'd say, oh, Frank, man, this just happened in our community and we're struggling. And I said, it is. It's an up and down. It's a roller coaster ride and never to give up hope. It's um, the role of the school administrator now. You know, we have in some places, when you look at one side, we have anti-bullying campaigns. We have equity training. We have the embrace of different cultures and interests and opportunities. And then in other places, on the other side of it, we have socioeconomic issues. We have racial tension, anti-immigration in places. It seems like the role of the school administrator has changed so much. So how does a school administrator balance everything that is involved in society now and also the crisis management? Because it seems like a very large responsibility that grows every single day. It's amazing. I've done interviews for the past 20 years, and that's the first time I've been asked that question. And what a great question. It's changed. And even towards the end of my career as a principal, it was different than when I started back in 1996. And the kids are coming in with different issues. Uh, our society is, uh, there are things happening within our culture in which there are different things to need to be addressed. And one of the things that I'm a, a strong proponent is it's all about relationships in that one adult. And it, it could be the principal, it could be the teacher, it could be the uh, billing facility manager, the food service, it's those relationships with kids and kids need to be feel comfortable. They need to know they need to care. And I think one of the most challenging things now for principals is to make sure when they're talking to their teachers, when they're talking to school personnel, that they need to make sure that it's difficult. What I see happening is there are so many teachers now because of the state of affairs in the nation to have an opinion. And where I see teachers getting in trouble is when they do voice those opinions out because you have both sides. You know, and one of the things that concerned me last year when there was a March for Life uh, after the Parkland shooting and there were kids that walked out and, you know, the big issue was we need tougher gun laws, we need you know, we need to tighten up and we cannot worry about what the NRA is saying, but there are people who believe in the Second Amendment rights. And as a principle, what you have to do is be able to balance that and respect the opinions of both. And even in our society today, we have difference of opinions, but it's how people approach it, that even though we could agree to disagree, we respect each other's opinion. And what I see is I think there are political people that don't... Uh, they're not the best role models for that type of behavior. And I think as administrators, we have to say, we know how you feel, but you have to be able to listen to both sides. And I think that that's a tough task for us right now in our society. I want to go back really quickly to the aftermath portion of it, because you, in your presentation to us, you talked a little bit about having to go and interact with the parents and the families afterwards and how... There were some in your ear that said, you shouldn't do this. Um, but you told us in your presentation, sometimes you have to stand up for what is right, uh, even if you're standing alone. And when you talk about the relationships you have had over these 20 years, and I'm assuming you will have them for, you know, for the rest of your life, uh, how does that connection work? And how does that still impact you today? It it's, it's impacts me every time I see them. Uh, I was doing an interview for a news station, Channel 9 in Denver, KSUA, K 
KUSA, and we were talking about the 20 year, and there was a family that was getting ready to interview after me, Lauren Townsend's mom and stepdad were there and talked about the graduation where Lauren uh, was the valedictorian. And I, out of the corner of my eye, I see Don, Anna, and Bruce Beck, and I start crying when I told that story because it took me back, and they're crying. And we'll always have that relationship. And, you know, and, and what gets me is a couple of years ago, um, on April 20th, I invite all the families to come back to Columbine, and I read the names, and not all families show up. But it was a couple of years ago that Daryl Scott, Rachel's dad, came up to me, and he's crying, and he hugs me, and he said, do you realize Rachel has been dead as many years as she was alive? And it just it took me back to that act, you know, that day. And there's times that I'm having conversation with people, and I look at those families, and their look in their eyes takes me back to that night that I was at Leewood Elementary and had to tell the parents that they, there's a good chance their child lost their life. And that's something that is etched on my brain for the rest of my life. And it's one of the reasons I go out. And the thing that I really work towards, and I know it's difficult when I talk to these other communities because they're getting advice that you can't talk to the parents. And they said, why did you do it? And I said, it's something I felt I needed to do. And in the long run, it helped. And originally, those conversations did not start out uh, very amicable. But as time went on, I answered questions, and they realized that some of the stuff that was reporting in the media was not accurate, and I tried to clarify that. And as a result of that, 20 years later, uh, I do have relationships with most of the family, some not as close as others, but I really felt I'd do it all over again. The National Association of School Superintendents represents more than 14,000 school superintendents in the country. And they're going to Washington, D.C., the organization, going to D.C., and they're going to advocate on behalf of school safety and mental health practices, not just for students, but for teachers and, and educators in general. Throughout your travels, how important is it for educators to come together, to go to Washington, to talk about these issues and bring some of these real life stories and experiences to our federal lawmakers to move them to really think about how do we as a country evolve when we consider these two positions? I think it's vital. They need to share the voices of their constituents. And so many times I think lawmakers are making laws without talking to educators and the impact that it's going to have. And I was fortunate that I had good relationships with the state legislators that were making the law, but also the national legislators. And I said, you really need to talk to us about the impact that law is going to have. And so I think it's so important for them to voice the, you know, the concerns they have for everyone. And, you know, one of the things that I share, and I know there's laws out there where it started back when I was, you know, teaching uh, standard-based education or core education and things of that nature, and we do testing, testing, testing. But if students do not feel safe, if they're hungry, they're not going to learn. And I don't care which program. And I think educators need to realize it's the social environment that is also important in the learning uh, environment. And I share this in my presentation. I think people are looking for one thing that's going to stop school violence. Well, it's more than one thing. You know, do we need tougher gun laws? Do we need sensible gun laws? Yes. But we also need to look at mental health. We need to look at threat assessment programs. We need to look at the impact social media is having on our kids. And we need to come together. And one of the things that I recommend when I go to these conferences is we need to get all the right people around the table. That In addition to having superintendents, we should have mental health workers, we should have school resource officers, because they're all responsible for our kids, and I think that's an important lesson to be taken. When you travel around the country, what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Obviously, you can tell your story, and it is a moving story, and it's a tear-jerking story, especially when you talk about what took place at Columbine High School, but even more so about the aftermath and the impact, not just to those families that had a student lost, but everybody in the community. So when you go out, talk nationally, talk to these administrators who are really dealing with the issue at hand, 
What are you hoping to accomplish beyond just telling your story? Well, today after the presentation, someone came out and said that because of lessons learned from Columbine, their school avoided, they avoided major disaster from happening because they had implemented the standard response protocol. And they said, if we, you know, prior to Columbine, we didn't know about that. And because of what the kids did and how they reacted and how the community reacted, it saved lives. So it's those stories. Or um, I've had others talk about teen suicide and the impact that they had had and the whole relationship piece and things of that nature. And I just, again, I'm not an expert, but I'm hoping that they take something from it. You know, that's why I end uh, my presentation about talking about inclusiveness because I really believe that the two killers from Columbine, and I make this comment all the time, they didn't come out of their mother's womb hating. What happened from the time they came out of their mother's womb because I saw these kids in their soccer uniforms missing their teeth with a grin from ear to ear, that they're sweet looking kids. And then I also saw one of them pointing a gun at me. What happened in that time frame? And as educators, did we miss something as community members? And I think that's where we need to come together because they're all of our kids. And I'm hoping that that opens the eyes to some of these people. And um, I think that's what I hope that they take away. We have a school administrator uh, here in California, a superintendent. There was a shooting uh, at a school in his district and he has said many times the reason why we had no casualties is because we've gone through drills and we made them realistic and essentially what happened was um, the school receptionist this is a very rural area heard gunshots from a distance and thought hmm those gunshots seem a little bit closer than they should be and every school employee, every adult on campus is empowered that if you feel like the school should be locked down, lock it down. And she called for a lockdown. And as the students are getting into the classroom, 30 seconds later, a guy in a pickup truck rams his truck into the front gate, knocks down the gate, pulls out a gun, starts shooting. One injury one child is injured and it's because of as he says the drills that we put in place the realism that they put behind those drills and then empowering the school employees if they feel the need to lock down a school do it as far as drills are concerned you talked about how you have to do them but they have to be real right Tell us a little bit about that and your experience and what you tell administrators. I tell administrators is they need to be taken seriously. I know at Columbine, when we did them, um, there were times, even though we went through one of the most horrific days in the history of education in, in, within our country, but I'd walk by and we'd be doing these drills and teachers would continue to teach. And, and we actually, I would bring in law enforcement officers and district security people that we would debrief with the teachers stating, you know, we have these drills and we use the standard response protocol, which is lockdown, lockout, uh, shelter, and evacuation. But we would actually debrief saying, do you realize where you were in that situation, you were vulnerable to a perpetrator? Or do you realize by having your cell phones, the lights, would, de uh, would alert people coming in. And so we did these drills. And the other thing that I recommended, or I recommend, is the fact that so many times we do these drills when we're in a very structured situation. That We do the drills during second period when everyone's in class. I said, when's the last time you've done a drill during a passing period? When kids are actually in the hallway, how are you gonna respond in a lockdown situation? Or have you ever done a drill during lunch hour? Well, we can't do that. It's not practical. And I said, killers or perpetrators aren't thinking about the practice. We're going to do this during second hour. No, they're going to do it whenever they feel the urge. And a lot of times these kids are looking, these perpetrators, these killers are looking at the time in which they could do the most damage. And it worries me that a lot of these shooters look at, the emergency plans that are in place a lot of places have locked doors during the day that that students have to go through or visitors have to go through a vestibule 
Well, what some of these shooters are doing now, just for example, is Parkland. They're doing it when all students are arriving that they know that those doors are not locked or after school when they know those doors are not locked. They're planning these things. So that's why you have to plan throughout. One of the things that worries me, especially at the high school level, we plan for drills during the school day, but in high schools, you have a lot of events after school. I mean, the buildings are occupied in high schools from 4 o'clock until 10 Mm -hmm. o'clock at night. What happens when there's not administrators on duty, but you have a situation, a gunman in the building at a, a school practice or a play practice or a game, you better drill during those times too. So you have to drill under all circumstances. Frank, it's an honor to have had you here today. Oh, we really pleasure. do appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank you folks for watching.